the Equitable Life Assurance Society presents, this is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Homeowners and home buyers, please listen closely. In about 14 minutes, the Equitable Society has important news for you. It's about the amazing Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan. A money-saving, worry-saving, home-saving plan that combines a low-cost mortgage with life insurance protection. So listen carefully for all the facts about the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan, one of the finest services offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Student of Violence. Murder is a crime that is committed under many different circumstances. Sometimes because of passion, other times for profit. Still other killings are perpetrated because of a desire for revenge. But whatever the reason might be, it is always a crime committed by a person with an inflated ego. Because no one but an egomaniac could possibly believe that he had the right to take the life of another human being. That there are too many such egomaniacs in the United States is a matter of official record. For the files of your FBI reveal that in the past year, there has been an average of more than 37 homicides every day. A figure which, when broken down, reveals that there is a criminal homicide committed every 38 and 8 tenths minutes throughout the day and night. That figure presents a genuine menace to you, the law-abiding citizen, Because, as you will see from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, not every criminal homicide finds another criminal as the victim. Very often, it is a decent, unsuspecting citizen who meets death. Someone like you. Tonight's file opens at the White Pine Inn, a popular summer resort. A young, rather attractive girl is at the telephone. Hello, honey boy. This is Olive. Uh-huh. I'm over here at this white pine inn. Mm-hmm. Got a little old me a job here yesterday. Yeah, I got you, Lily. I guess I just got especially lonesome for you after I saw your picture in the paper. With that cute little gal like Miss Patricia something. Uh, Scott, that's it. I must say you two made a real cute couple. Huh? I had to come here, honey boy. I had to protect my interests. Oh, no, sugar. I couldn't think of a divorce. I want to keep on being married. You know, sugar, if I didn't love you, I'd say you want to marry that Scott girl because she's so rich. Oh, now, really, honey boy. What would you pay me with? Money you got from her? I don't need money that bad. Sugar, I'm not interested in a divorce. Sure, I'll meet you where? The boathouse down by the lake? Well, I don't know where it is, but I'll find it. Okay, Sugar. Bye now. Two days later, in a nearby city... Sergeant Montgomery, a state trooper, approaches the desk of Special Agent Jim Taylor at the FBI field office. Jim, your agent in charge says that you might be able to help me on a case I'm working on. He said you know Greene County pretty well. That's right. Well, this thing happened at Lake Beaver. Huh? What's the story on it, Sergeant? Well, I was called in this morning by the manager at the White Pine Inn. He told me one of his waitresses was missing, a girl named Olive Ward. 
She'd been missing for two days now, and I thought maybe she'd gone home until I searched her room and found a threatening letter. Sergeant, I assume the agent in charge explained to you that we don't have any jurisdiction unless the note was sent to the mail? Yes, he did. Oh, good. This note was sent to the girl at Centerville, New Jersey, where she used to work, and the postmark on the envelope was Lake Beaver. Any signature? Well, just the initial J. I see. No return address on the envelope, of course? No, not a thing on it. Front or back. And it's your feeling that something has happened to the girl, is that right? Yeah, you see, Miss Ward had only worked at the hotel one day, and one of the waitresses told me that she got a phone call that first night she was there. It was from a man. Any ident on him? No. But after the call, Miss Ward asked her which way it was to the boathouse. That's the White Pine Inn boathouse? Yeah, that's right. She also asked about using a canoe because she said she had a date. As I remember, it used to be that you just took a canoe whenever you wanted. Well, it's still that way, and obviously Miss Ward and her date used one because it's still missing. That's a pretty big lake to drag, Sergeant. <laughs> it's too big. There used to be a lot of private boats on the lake. Quite a few private planes out at the airport. Yeah, they're still there. Well, we might organize them and start a searching party. I stopped listening to that kind of talk when I was seven. But it is. Come on in. I'll get enough exercise at the dance tonight. Sissy. Hey, by the way, what time do you want me to pick you up? Huh? When should I call for you? Jeff, you're going to murder me. I forgot. What? I forgot about us. I made another date. Well... Can't you break it, Pat? She wouldn't do a thing like that to me. Hi, Johnny. Hi, honey. I should have known her date was with you. Hey, give me a hand, one of you. Here. Here you go. Ah, oh, I've got an idea on how to see which one of you takes me to the band. Ah, oh, what is it? Well, you're both good swimmers. Have a race. The winner takes me. Okay with me? Hey, look, Pat, I still got this bum shoulder from swimming the other day. I knew you'd pull some kind of an alibi. Hey, now, wait a minute. If that's how you play... Hey. We were all kidding. Well, I'm not going to let... it. I'm going to the dance with both of you. Hi, son. Come give a hand there. Thanks, Jim. Uh, 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 here, the coroner came out here. Yeah. Yeah, he made a preliminary examination. Said that Miss Ward had been dead for two days. Ah, uh -huh. where'd you find her? In a small cove the other side of this island. Looked like drowning, but the coroner said she was dead when she hit the water. Marks on her head indicate that she was beaten. Any idea what the weapon was? Not yet. Maybe the lad can tell us, though. Any footprints? Well, some that looked like they belonged to a man and a woman, but they were too indistinct to furnish any impression. Uh -huh. Oh, is that the missing canoe over there? Yeah, no, that's it. Looks like a murderer swam back to shore. Uh -huh. Anything else? Yeah, there was a rather clumsy attempt to remove the labels from Miss Ward's clothes. Leads me to believe this was done by an amateur. Well, I'd say the most likely suspect is the person who wrote her that threatening note. Yeah, I'll go along with that. And as much as the note was postmarked Lake Beaver, Jim, I think the killer might still be here. Maybe yes, maybe no. We know this girl came out here from Centerville to see somebody. Uh huh. And we know she was here only one day. Therefore, it's my assumption that whoever wrote the letter knew her in Centerville. I see. And it's probable that while the actual murder took place here at Lake Beaver, the motive is back in Centerville, too. That sounds good to me. Sergeant, I think I'll fly back there and see what I can find out. <laughs> something, Pat. I thought this was never going to happen. What, Johnny? Dancing with you. I've been trying for hours. I haven't been trying very hard. Honey, every time I even started for you, off you'd go with another guy with a crew haircut. <laughs> not true. Well, now that I've got you, I'm not going to lose you. Come on. Huh? Just come with me. Go ahead, honey. Yes. A little less competition out here on the terrace. Mm-hmm. Can I have a sit -in? Sure, honey. Here. Yeah. 
Pat. I had a reason for bringing you out here. Mm-hmm. It has to do with you and Jeff. Well? I never really knew Jeff, although we did go to the same school at the same time, but I know some fellas who are friends of his. They all think Jeff's a real nice guy. Johnny, what's this all about? Well, I think you ought to marry him. Huh? Mm -hmm. You're both nice guys. You'll be happy with it. Look, answer one thing for me. Is the John in your name for John Alden? I'm serious, Pat. I am, too. If you're not John Alden, stop imitating me. Pat, you're engaged to the guy. We were engaged. Huh? Gave him back his ring last week. Oh, I didn't know that. I was telling you all this about marrying him, I mean, because I wanted to bow out gracefully. Johnny, I don't want you to. Huh? I don't want you to bow out. to come out in this canoe. Been on the lake for ten minutes and I'm tossed out. <laughs> What's the matter with you? I... Well, I saw you go out in the carriage with Johnny. Oh. What happened to us, Pat? Oh, I don't know, Jack. You went away to finish college. Well, I guess maybe I grew up. Pat, I still want to marry you. I'm afraid you're too late. Well, what do you mean? Johnny asked me to marry you tonight. Yeah. You didn't accept me. Yes, I did. But you can't. Please, Jeff. I, I... I won't let you. Jeff, take me back to the dance. No. Jeff. Well, I'm not taking you back until you listen to me. You can't marry him. I won't let you do it. Jeff, sit down. I've got to tell you something first. Jeff, you're tipping the canoe. Sit down. No. You're going to listen to me. Jeff, look out. Jeff! <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI protects American citizens and American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. Protection against mortgage foreclosure. A plan that has made it possible for thousands of homeowners to have a mortgage-burning celebration like this. All right, Peggy. You strike the match. Now, light the mortgage at this end. There she goes. Look at her burn. No more mortgage at our home. We own it free and clear. Yes, it's an old American custom to burn a canceled mortgage. And when you have an equitable society assured home ownership plan, the great day when the mortgage is paid up often comes much sooner than you originally expected. This money-saving, home-saving plan combines a low-cost first mortgage with special life insurance protection. Thanks to the life insurance side of this plan, a special cash fund is built up. It's always ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. As the mortgage shrinks, this cash fund increases. For example, it can be used to pay off a 20-year mortgage in approximately 15 years. In addition, the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan protects the home against the greatest hazard of all, the death of the breadwinner. In the Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid under the plan to reduce the principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. And last but not least, the mortgage interest is only 4%. And there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So all in all, a man is very fortunate. If his health, age, income, home, and its location qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. The way to find out if you qualify is to get in touch with your equitable society representative. Look in the phone book or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's the QUI. T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States.
Now back to tonight's file, The Student of Violence. In many respects, murderers are like all other criminals. And perhaps the most pointed similarity is that they do not necessarily look like criminals. A killer can be male or female. If he is a male, he can be tall or short, strong or weak, very masculine or quite a feat. And he may breathe fire or be as meek as a one-day-old kitten. There are no blueprints which describe what a criminal must look like. And the actual fact of the matter is that many people who commit crimes look as if they might be frightened by a dark room at night. Human beings are complex mechanisms, and they are capable of the most heartwarming kindnesses, the utmost gentility, and the ultimate in courage. But by the same token, they are also capable of the basest treachery, the infinite in cruelty, and the wanton disregard of the laws which have been written in order to ensure the continuation of civilization. Yes, human beings can reach the heights of nobility or the depths of reckless immorality. And the truly terrifying thing is that sometimes both can be reached by the same person. Tonight's file continues at the State Trooper Barracks in the office of Sergeant Montgomery. Colonel Jim, are you back from Centerville already? I got in about 15 minutes ago. How'd you make out? Well, I don't know yet myself. I checked on Olive Ward's background. How'd you get anything? Well, she'd been in Centerville about six or eight months. She came there from Spartanburg, Alabama, and got a job as a waitress at one of the sandwich shops, a place that caters to the college crowd. Well, a pretty girl must have fit into a place like that. Oh, from what the proprietor told me, she didn't make too many dates. Oh? Yeah, and then he said that a couple of months ago, she got married to one of the boys from the school. Hey, that could be the lead we're looking for, Jim. Uh, that's what I thought, except neither the proprietor nor anyone else seems to know whom she married. The only thing I could find out is that when he graduated, he left her. But there must have been a marriage license file. Well, it's not on record in Centerville or in any of the surrounding towns. I see. No, one other thing. I got a warrant and I went to the rooming house where the girl used to live. Finally, they gave me this ring. Huh? Yeah, take a look at it. Thanks. You said Miss Ward left it there when she moved out. It's a graduation ring. The new one's on it there, 46. Uh-huh. Are there initials inside? Yeah, those are her initials, O.W. I went back to the sandwich shop, asked the proprietor if he had ever seen the ring before. He said he had. On her? Yes, he said that she used to wear it. That's when he told me that she came from Spartanburg. Well, what do you do now, Jim? Well, Sergeant, I think I'll fly down to Spartanburg and see what I can pick up. Maybe that's where the answer to this case is. Mr. Johnny, the doctor doesn't want anyone to stay with Miss Scott too long this evening. Well, then I won't even bother going in. Oh, he said it was all right for you. She's been asking for you. Oh, thanks. Johnny? Uh Uh-huh. Come in. How do you feel, honey? Better, thanks. You had me scared there for a while last night. You must have swallowed an awful lot of water don't even remember swimming ashore. You didn't? Well, then how... I was on the shore. I jumped in and pulled both of you out. Jeff, too? Yeah. He wasn't doing much swimming when I got to him. He said later that he was hit on the head with the point of the canoe when it turned over. I see. Darling, I don't have to tell you how grateful I am. Oh, stop, honey. I'm just glad you... you're here. Johnny. Yes, dear? Out last night with Jeff. Yeah. I don't know how to say this. Maybe it's just my imagination. When I told Jeff that we were going to be married, well, it almost looked as if he turned the canoe over on purpose. <laughs> Sorry, were you sleeping? Oh, so was Doc. I, I 
came over to apologize. <laughs> and I, I know that it's impossible to undo what I've already done, and I, I know I made a complete fool of myself. But when you said you were going to marry Johnny, I, I just lost my head. Let's drop it, Jeff. We're both sorry it happened. Let it go again. Yes, but there was something I wanted to tell you. Before I say it, though, I, I want you to know that I still love you. And this has nothing to do with the fact that you said no to me. What are you trying to say, Jeff? Uh, did you see the newspaper yesterday? Yes. Did you see a story about a waitress from the White Pine Inn? Yes, I did. Her picture was in the paper, too. I know. I remember that girl, Pat. She used to work in a hamburger place in Centerville. All of the fellows at school used to eat there. Oh? Last spring, after exams were over, I went away for a couple of days of golf and rest. I, I went up to a lodge in the mountains near school. While I was there, I saw Johnny and this girl together. <laughs> Was that so awful? I'm sure Johnny had dates before. This wasn't a date, Pat. They were registered as Mr. and Mrs. Buchanan. What? According to the newspaper, the man they're looking for, the man they think is the murderer, is the girl's husband. Jeff Clinton, this is the dirtiest thing I ever heard of. Accusing Johnny of murder. You get out of here. Okay, Pat. But it's only fair to tell you when I leave here, I'm going to the police. You're going to tell them that story? Well, I've got to. Haven't you the courage to confront Johnny with this? Sure. I'll be glad to. Then come back at six. I'll have Johnny here. Hi, Sarge. Hello, oh, Jim. You just got in ahead of the storm. Yeah. Did you find the answers in Spartanburg? Well, not all of them, but some. I got there and looked up the name Ward in the phone book. There yeah. were 33 of them. I checked every single one. None of them knew the girl. Oh, fine. So I went to the Board of Education and checked through their records. No one named Olive Ward graduated from any school in 1946. Maybe the ring threw us off. No, it finally worked out. I, I kept thinking about that ring and how it might help us, and I finally came up with the right answer. What was that? Well, I figured that if she graduated in 1946, then her picture should be in one of the school's yearbooks. Yeah. So I checked the ring to see which school it was made for. I looked through their yearbook and finally found her picture. I don't understand, Jim. You just said that the Board of Education didn't have any Olive Ward on their records. Well, that's because her name wasn't Olive Ward. She graduated as Olive Ward Chesky. She's a Polish girl. Oh, I see. Apparently, she has no relatives left in Spartanburg because I couldn't find any other Ward Chesky's in the city. I even checked all the voting records. Oh, excuse me. Certainly. Hello. Sergeant Gummer speaking. Oh, yes, just a minute. For you, Jim. Oh, hi. Hello. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. Will you wait a minute while I write that down? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Thanks very much. Sergeant, here's the answer we've been looking for. Who was that? That was the license bureau at Blackport. That's a little town near Centerville. A lot of college kids go there to be married, so I wired them and asked them to check their records. Well, did they find the name of the man who married Olive Ward? Yeah. Well, let's get a warrant and close this case. <laughs> Cigarette, Pat? No, thanks. How about a drink? Not right now. Pat, is anything bothering you? Honey, I... I've been trying to think of a way to slide into an unpleasant subject. You haven't changed your mind about us, have you? No. Well, then, what is it, honey? Jeff Clinton was over this afternoon. Oh? He told me a horrible story. What was it, an alibi for last night? No. He said that... He said that you knew that waitress from the hotel who was found dead this week. He said I knew her? Yes. He, he said she used to work in a restaurant in Centerville. Did you know? Boy, I might have said good evening to her a couple of times when I went down to have a late hamburger. But I didn't even know her name. Oh, I'm glad. Why? Oh, Jeff said that you went away for a weekend with her and that you were registered as man and wife. Oh, that's the biggest schoolboy trick I ever heard that's of. That's what I told him. And I'm very pleased that you've been telling he's a liar when he comes here. 
He's coming back? Yes, he said he'd be here by six. What do you bet he doesn't show up? He said he would. Oh, I know that guy, Pat. I know how he operates. Well, this time he isn't going to get away with it. I'm going to find him and make him come here and tell you he was lying. Wait, Johnny, he could be on his way. I don't want to wait. I want to clear this up now. That's a good idea, Johnny. Huh? Jeff. Let's clear up the whole thing. Oh. You mean that phony story you told her? It isn't phony, Johnny. You know that. He didn't even know the girl, Jeff. Let him speak for himself, Pat. Sure. I didn't know that girl any better than you did, Jeff. I didn't even know her name until I saw her picture in the paper. You're a liar. Oh, look. Will you go to the police with me? Certainly, I'll go, won't you, Johnny? No. What? Well, I don't have to prove myself to you, do I? If you've got nothing to hide, why are you afraid of the police? Well, I... Look, I've heard enough of this. You, you get out of here, Jeff. I'll get out when you come with me. Johnny, why don't you go with him? Pat, are you on his side? Johnny, all I'm trying to do You're is... You're trying play. to frame me. John. I didn't know that girl. John, I saw Shut you. Shut up. I'm leaving here now, and I'm leaving alone. Johnny, honey, what are you doing? Stay where you are. <laughs> all of you, Cannon. Huh? Almo. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. All right, Buchanan, you're coming with me. John Buchanan was turned over to local authorities who tried and convicted him on the charge of first-degree murder. Special Agent Taylor was able to apprehend the homicidal maniac in tonight's case because he learned that John Buchanan had married the waitress, Olive Ward. That clue led to a search of Buchanan's room, which revealed two things. One, the typewriter which had been used to write the threatening letter, and two, the labels which had been torn from the clothing of the dead girl. When confronted with that evidence, Buchanan broke down and confessed, and thus another FBI file was closed. Yes, this file was closed. And closed successfully because a special agent would not give up his relentless pursuit of every possible clue. A pursuit which led ultimately, as it invariably does, to the killer. There are many copybook maxims which you see applied in your everyday life. Maxims which tell simple truths in simple language. One maxim seen in their everyday work by members of your FBI is the one which reads... Murder will out. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Friends, if you were impressed a few minutes ago by what I told you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the idea appeals to you of a low-interest rate first mortgage combined with life insurance to protect your home against death and hard times, then I suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable representative soon. He'll show you exactly what this plan will do for you personally, how much money it can save you, how much added security it will give you. So contact your Equitable Society representative without delay or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a colorful story of a manhunt on the Western Plains. Its subject, draft evasion. Its title, The Hollywood Horseman. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Hollywood Horseman on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.